Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode. This is your main host, Udo Baricic. And for today's topic, I have my special guest back on, Jeffrey Nilkovich. Jeff, how are you doing? I'm doing good. So far, no cough. Well, I could say the same too here. Now, we in, in Sweden, we have over 2,000 people that have died. Uh, from this COVID-19, at least the, we have the official figure saying that. So, uh, and so far we've been, I mean, trying to cope with this isolation the best that we possibly can. How is it going on for you? Uh, <clears throat> well, California is still in lockdown and, uh, you know, we, we've got a stable, we've sort of got a stable number of cases. They're not growing here in Humboldt County where I am, um, but there are, uh, the country in the United States, there's a big argument between the people who want to uh, say the virus isn't that bad, let's go to work, and the people who say, which include the president saying, no, we need to ride this out a bit longer, and uh, like right now there's an uh, argument between the governor of Georgia and the president, because he, the governor of Georgia, wants to open some things back up, and the president's saying this might not be safe. So it's kind of interesting to watch it play out uh, because we have, you know, we have a federal system. So some of the states aren't going to do the same thing as the president sure. wants. So it's it's interesting. Absolutely. And of course, and we like, like, uh, uh, like, like we, we said, we, we're going to have to monitor this and see what will happen. And uh, I mean... What are the powers that be actually wanting, what they're describing to do? Are they going to install some kind of surveillance regime and so on? I think it's necessary to keep that in mind too, even though I truly believe that this is some sort of, like you and I have discussed in the past, we were hit by some sort of biological weapon in one way or another. And now we see that it keeps spreading and it's still, it's not contained this virus yet. So yeah. But uh, I've been thinking there, there's a lot of discussion about this corona and so on. But what I want to focus on for today's session is it will be actually uh, a little bit, you know, discussing about your work because you have written extensively on this subject. So what we're going to focus for today's topic will be if the Soviet Union uh, ever did fall. So we're going to, because you have claimed on numerous occasions and so on, and especially in your writings, that the Soviet Union they somehow they faked their this let's say disinte disintegration in order to adapt themselves to to the to to the new let's say geopolitical situation and also the new world order somehow so so we we say we have the same cadres that ruled the Soviet Union but they have now just let's say changed uh, and adapted themselves to the new let's say the political discourse. So how does that sound to focus a little bit on that? Well, that'd be great. That's one of my favorite topics, so absolutely. Okay. Yes. Okay, but first off, I want to get, because your take, like uh, when we follow the official narrative in, in history and so on, we see many empires, that they, the empires, they were born and then they all of a sudden, they, they fell. You know, we, we've seen this like with the Roman Empire, with the Byzantine Empire, with the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and so, so on. They're born and then all of a sudden they fell. Now, my first question to you is, why do you not believe that this is the case in the Soviet example, please? Well, uh, if you follow the defector literature before the collapse of the Soviet Union, you have defectors like uh, Anatoly Galitsyn, Zadislav Bitman, and Jan Shana warning that there was a plan that they knew about to fake the collapse of the Warsaw Pact. Um, and that, like uh, Shana wrote, that secret committees of Comic-Con were going to run the alliance behind the scenes, that the basic structures of the Communist Party were going to go underground and were going to operate through corporations and, uh, and businesses, and they were going to control everything in a different way. And that the preparation for this uh, offensive would take 25, 30 years. Uh, the plan was, according to Anatoly Galitsyn, the plan was 
officially adopted by the global by meetings of, of uh, global communist parties in different countries uh, participating in 1960. The planning phase started in 57, 56, 57, uh, actually late 56, um, and they worked it all out. In fact, they conducted a reorganization of the KGB when uh, Ivan Serov was, was uh, uh, basically removed as head of the KGB and replaced with Alexander Shalepin. Um, I think that was 1958. Uh, Serov was made head of the GRU, and uh, Shalepin, who was a, uh, uh, a protege of a KGB general named Nikolai Mironov, Mironov uh, who was one of the strategists. He was the author of this, this idea of, a, of, a, uh, of doing a super NEP, you know, claiming that you know, Russia was reforming and going to capitalism and liberalism, the Soviet Union was. Um, uh, he became the head of the KGB, and they had to reorganize the KGB so that uh, information about this deception would never leak out. And so they created an inner KGB of officers that would never be allowed to leave the country, basically, or leave the country only under certain circumstances. I'm not sure how the protocols worked. but And then an outer KGB, which were the agents they sent out to work abroad, who did not really know about the plan. So if they defected or were captured or whatever, uh, compromised in some way, they couldn't give anything away. So mm-hmm. they restricted the circle of knowledge, and the, oh, of course, if we hold, 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 just, yeah, very good. But if we hold back, so basically, when you say Glasnost and Perestroika, it, it was somehow of a, of a new uh, NEP 2.0, you might say, or yes, it was NEP 2.0. Uh, Miranov was a great admirer of uh, of uh, Felix Dzerzhinsky's deputy, whose name was Menzinsky, who spoke fluent Mandarin and was very uh, enamored with Sun Tzu, the Chinese ancient strategist, uh, who taught, you know, uh, that when you're strong, appear weak, and weak, appear strong, hold out baits, entice the enemy, feign disorder, and destroy him. Uh, Sun Tzu said the deception was the essence of warfare. And Menzinsky therefore came up with this idea of the trust and the trust operation trust which is the core of the nep lenin announced that we don't know how to build a communist economy so we are going to retreat into state capitalism and of course uh, parallel with this plan they created a fake czarist organization and it was called the trust because it meant a bank building and it was a uh, an anti-bolshevik organization which the Bolsheviks themselves made to basically overthrow themselves or pretend to overthrow themselves and sell it to the West as a reality. And by the time you get into the early 1920s, every intelligence service in Western Europe, in Europe, believed that the trust was a genuine uh, Tsarist organization, genuine opposition. Its, Its headquarters were a bank building in Moscow. And the, the trust worked with all of the Western intelligence services. It smuggled people in and out of the Soviet Union. It rescued people. It provided intelligence to the British, the French, the Germans, the Swedes, the Romanians, the Poles. Um, and there was nobody that really that said, no, this is not. Uh, I mean, perhaps it's it's been said that uh, the great master spy, um, Sidney Riley questioned the trust and said that the trust was a fake. But Sidney Riley went in there to try to prove the trust was a fake, some people say, and he died. He, he was captured and then executed. Uh, I think it was sure. 1926. Um, so the, 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 trust, uh, uh, the trust was then uh, basically the, the mask was ripped off in the late 20s. I think Stalin uh-huh. made a speech, uh, it was 29 maybe, 28, 29, 30, he made the speech, you know, and it was the end of NEP. Um, I think it was 29. Uh, and uh, so it was a period, by the way, when people say uh, the capitalist financed the Soviet Union, it was because the, ca- fi- the capitalists were fooled into thinking the Soviet Union had basically uh, fallen within to a group of czarists who were going to transform it, that Lenin had abandoned communism, that it really wasn't a communist formation anymore. And that, uh, therefore, it was okay to go in and set up factories. And, you know, the Rockefellers came in and built up the Soviet oil industry. Uh-huh. You had uh, Avril uh, Harriman come uh, in. and the, I, I, 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I understand. Yeah. I just, I, I know. And it was from 1921 to 1926 when the Soviet Union, you know, it was newly formed and so on. But, but what I want to ask you is like this, like you see the schism, let's say the cracks within the Warsaw Pact. Let's say you have 1948 when, when Tito and Yugoslavia, they, 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 let's say, departed from the Warsaw Pact. They left the Warsaw Pact to start the non-aligned movement in the, you know, like a third mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. And and then you had also the, the well-known uprisings, 1956 in Hungary, and then you have it in the, in at that time called Czechoslovakia, 1968. Well, what would you say about those, let's say, cracks within the Soviet bloc? Were they genuine or were they, let's say, anticipated or made up or Please. Oh, well, that it's always very difficult to govern people who don't want to be under your thumb. So, of course, the Soviet Union was always, I mean, you had this Russian Civil War in which the whites came and tried to overthrow the Bolsheviks. You, you, you had all kinds of threats. When you have this experimental new form of, of uh, society, the Soviet Union, communism, uh, where they're they're building socialism and they're trying to build new institutions, it's quite brutal. You're killing people, you're jailing people, you're intimidating people, you're taking people's property away. And of course, the Soviet army coming into uh, Central Europe uh, in at the end of World War II, I mean, for, uh, what is it, um, May 9th is uh, the victory day that the, that the they celebrate in Moscow defeating the Nazis. But for a lot of people in Central and Eastern Europe, it's the day that the Soviet occupation, you know, marking the, the Soviet occupation at the end of World War II, that, um, that really it, it, it marked the end of their freedom uh, and they're having their own countries and not being under the thumb of the communists. So, yeah, they had unrest, uh, you know, in 1953 in, in East Germany. They had, uh, when you get to 56, you've got problems in Poland. You've got the serious uprising in Hungary. Uh, in, indeed, but that was why it was very always a method used uh, going back in Tsarist times of controlled opposition. Um, the the Tsarist Zars, regimes perfected it. You infiltrate your opposition, you take it over, and you control it, and therefore you guide it so that it doesn't overthrow you. Yeah, because the way we see it from a crow advantage point, for instance, like when 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 Croatia was subordinated and had to integrate in this Yugos Yugoslavian Federalist Socialist Republic. I mean, it, it's, it, uh, you had the infamous Bleiburg massacre. I don't know if you heard about it. Um, yeah, I had, uh, I had somebody in one of my classes when I taught at the university whose family was, was a lot of their family members were killed in that massacre. Exactly, exactly. And so, but what happened, Tito, he was, let's say, he was schooled by the Bolshevik and he was very loyal to Stalin up until 1948 when he just, you know, he he moved to, to become more neutral in that sense that he wanted to move away from, let's say, the Warsaw Pact and so on. And, and the way we understand it, that there were several attempts to assassinate Tito from Moscow, because but what, what would you say about that? Well, yeah, of course, um, uh, Stalin wanted no uh, nobody to be more important in the communist movement than him. And he d he was obviously trying to strong arm Tito as a wrong person to try to do that to. And uh, Stalin tried to bump off Tito and Tito responded by, as I recall, he sent a, 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 a some kind of messenger or envoy to Stalin who handed him a notice that if this, if, if I were really going to assassinate you, you'd be dead right now. And I guess they say that that led Stalin to leave him alone. Yeah, he said like this, yeah. he said, you, I have had several attempts on my life and for me it's only, if I send one of my assassins, then it's the end for you. Yeah, that, that's it, the way he said. Right, yeah, yeah it was... Uh, some, and yeah, it was uh, he no, was very yeah. successful, and he was very successful with his secret intelligence. They wiped out all my countrymen that lived in Germany, in Sweden and so on, so we have very bad memories from this butcher from the Croat side. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, especially yeah. for exiled exile Croats living living abroad and so on. They targeted people that were 
nationalist and not even posing any severe threat to Yugoslavia. But 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 actually, 1948, he did actually uh, break with Stalin, and and he was actually Yugoslavia. What is very interesting was supported, especially from the West, because naturally the United States saw an opportunity to let's say create much more turmoil and within the Soviet bloc. So naturally they supported Tito's regime too. And after was Stalin died, they normalized you know the relationship with the Soviet Union. So they were able to balance both the West and the East to maximize the, their position as much as they possibly could. That's why Yugoslavia did not disintegrate as fast. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um I should add to that. It's very interesting because uh, you know, as you know, Khrushchev uh, criticized Stalin for many things. And one of the things Stalin criticized Khrushchev for was his bullying of Tito and the breaking away of Yugoslavia. And so uh, when this strategy was thought up and, and, and it was basically they went right for it after uh, the, the planning for this new strategy started after Khrushchev denounced Stalin in 56, the secret speech so-called. Um, and one of the points was Yugoslavia in here. And um, uh, Miranov's uh, uh, deputy, Shelopin, gave a lecture about the Tito-Stalin split in 1958. Uh, and Anatoly Galitsyn was present, this uh, KGB defector who defected in 61. And it was about the split. And the thing that fascinated the KGB strategists was the fact the U.S. went in and supported Tito, that you would have the West would support an actual communist country. Uh -huh. And they drew a lesson from this. And what Shalepin said is, we need to create a split between another communist country that's a fake split and get that country to be supported by the United States and built up by the United States. Uh -huh. And somebody raised their hand and said, Comrade General, who, what, what country would that be? And sh and Shalepin said China, and and that was that was like a year a year or so before the actual uh, you know rumor of the split between uh, Russia and China began mm -hmm. um, in 1960. Um, well, of course, so this During is very, stuff, yeah. and and uh, in fact Khrushchev wanted to cement things back up with Tito, and it, you it's interesting to know that Muranov died. Uh, when his airplane, he was going to uh, Yugoslavia, his airplane crashed. Uh, and the, in 1964, you know, Khrushchev went to see Tito in 1964. And of sure. course, it was shortly thereafter, because I think Miranov was a, a major prop supporting uh, Khrushchev's regime, that Khrushchev was overthrown by Brezhnev uh, uh -huh. after he got back from, from uh, meeting with Tito. But it, it's, uh, there was, yeah, there was a rapprochement we don't really know how, you know, how, whether they were ever going to trust each other again, but uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting element in that the idea of having a fake split with China was inspired by the genuine split with Tito. Sure. Uh, yes, but if we look, if we, if, okay, so if, if we look a little bit like, uh, for instance, we saw that uh, the, let's say when 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 soviet officially let's say disintegrated in 1991 they had free elections and and after after gorbachev Boris Yeltsin came to power and we saw that during that era in the beginning of the 1990s the 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 newly formed russian federation went through let's say an economic transition period of pretty harsh economic reforms called shock therapy and it was basically to privatize the economy to shift let's say from a central planned economy to a market economy and uh, those key figures that were involved in this was the, basically from the chicago school you had prominent economists like jeffrey sachs who was in charge of this or actually he was an advisor how to make this transition as smooth as possible not only to the countries belonging let's say not only to the Russian Federation, but also to most of the Central and Eastern European countries and so on. So it's time to private, to, to, to go on privatization and so on. And during that era, 
we also noticed, let's say, an oligarchy family taking much more control over the natural, let's say, over the resources, over the stock markets and everything. Uh, now, uh, why let these, let's say, capitalists dictate the conditions for the new economy? Was it to create a new NEP or please give me your side of the story? Well, they, they, they followed the same pattern. They used some of the same methods that were used during NEP uh, in the 1990s and in the late 80s when they started to do this. What the, mm -hmm. the, the idea of NEP for bringing in foreign companies was that no foreign company would ever own a majority share in a Russian company or a Soviet company, um, that they would only own a 49% share. A, a very famous case, a British Petroleum did this. They came in to help rebuild uh, parts of the, 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 the old Soviet oil infrastructure, oil production uh, mm -hmm. infrastructure. And of course, um, uh, that, as you know, if, if you only own 49%, they basically let them in to rebuild everything. But then when the time came, they would basically you know, push them out of their 49% and basically rob them. With BP, what they did is they basically wouldn't even allow BP executives uh, some years ago to even get visas to come into Russia. <laughs> so um, uh, they basically, it was a, it was a way of, yeah, it was a way but, of expropriating but, but, the capitalists by getting investment out of them. But what would you say to people who said, look, after the fall and after and with this shock therapy, you had, you had, let's say, for instance, it was time to integrate Russia in the world economy, to integrate Russia, to welcome Russia into the realm of all these financial institutions like Citibank, Goldman Sachs, like uh, the, the, the Schwarzman Group and so on. You have many of them. All of these, con this conglomerate of financial institutions and so on, opening up the country and making, l l let's say, uh, somehow benefiting these, these rich, rich made people so rich to the extent that the society was not able to function the limited welfare that, that the majority of the people had it was simply wiped out yeah well that was intentional if you read karen dewish's book and some of the other books about uh you know you read fiona hill and, and uh, clifford mm -hmm. gaddy and stuff uh you'll read many passages there was uh, in in vaxberg's book about the soviet mafia um, Vaxberg is one of the first people to document. He was a, he was a uh, Soviet journalist, a very brave one, almost got himself assassinated because of his investigations into the Soviet mafia. And uh -huh. uh, he, he had a anonymous uh, fan in the higher up uh, levels of the Communist Party who wrote to him, in, and this was at the time that, this is around 91 when the Soviet Union was unraveling. And he uh -huh. said, look, the you have to understand, um, they're building the capitalism so that the Russian people will be crushed by it intentionally, so that they will beg to have something like the old system back, that they'll beg to have a strong government back. And um, you see this again and again, that the, the purpose of the reforms, they were managed. Um, mm -hmm. You have, for example, the, the Boris Berezovsky or Gazinsky, you have, they, they decided intentionally to pick these uh, apparatchiks or academicians who were Jewish and make contracts with the KGB to make them into billionaires. Boris Berezovsky admitted to his, his friends privately that he mm. was made a billionaire by the KGB. He, was mm. a, he had a contract with them. He was a recruited agent. He, wasn't, he didn't become a billionaire on his own. He was but a, what he about... Was a, yeah. yeah, but the, not only Berezinsky, you have also Valery Kogan, you have Mikhail Friedan, the, the richest Russian on the face of the planet. Yeah, you've He's got Kordorkovsky and you had Guzinski and, and, and many others. They, they, they all were made into billionaires by agreement. With so, the so according to, so according, according to your view, you see these top, top tier billionaires controlling the, so much of the resources and so on, basically controlled, not controlled, but somehow shaped by the KGB. They're, they're, they're employees of the KGB. They're contractors with the KGB, and they have to do what they're told. And if they don't do what they're told, if, if they get annoyed with you, they just assassinate you. And they use the mafias to assassinate but, or eliminate. Some of these billionaires would escape but, abroad. 
but why would to... why would these world banks like for instance Goldman Sachs, Citibank, <laughs> Deutsche Bank, why would they all be invested in this oil and gas sector and and invest and be so invested heavily in Russia and also invite Russia into this global capitalist system uh, when they let's say for instance they're not stupid these institutions they obviously would figure out somehow if if KGB is, is is controlling certain let's say individuals but why would these institutions just be so heavily invested in Russia greed is a funny thing and the deception the 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 communist understood how to appeal to them after all what does a capitalist do he invests if he doesn't have something to look, look at could you would you resist investing into china or russia if you were a capitalist oh my gosh look at the labor costs look at the talent of the russian population and the low cost of this talent to acquire it and invest in it i mean you can you can you be drooling to get a, get your paws on that and the thing is, is that that they these people, businessmen, are monomaniacs. They know a great deal about very little, because they have to know their business. And and you know they don't quite understand how institutions like the KGB work. In fact, if you were to talk to an expert on the KGB, you would say it takes you years and years to comprehend their games to understand how they work. And for a businessman who is in a different area, who's absorbed in this business every day, he sure. has no time to learn. The intricacies uh, I, of how the KGB uh, operates. Uh, yeah, I understand. I understand your position. I don't view it actually that way. I view it that there are part of this, let's say, establishment in Russia. In Russia, like for instance, you have oligarchs like Mikhail Friedman, that is, you know, totally in 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 collaboration with Putin. You have it with Valery Kogan too. So they see, and Putin, he has also, you know, he has remained very good with some of the oligarchs too. It's simply I don't see it that he went all out to take out all of the olig oligarchs after when he no, came. No, he didn't. Out no, he didn't. Why would he go to take them all out? He would then no. if he. Why yeah. would he no, want no. to take them out? He I'm look. Saying, it's I'm like Miles Quark. Just... Miles yeah. Quark said made this point about the mil millionaires, the billionaires in China. Miles Quark, who was a billionaire in China, he said basically he admitted we're all recruited by the party to do what we do. Basically, they pick you, they make you into a billionaire, you have some talent. They want to find people who are talented or people who are able to put a good face on a business. And But Miles Kwok said, he said in an interview, he said, this is a, a Chinese billionaire who defected here last year, or was it two years ago? Uh, Miles Kwok said, there's only two ways a Chinese billionaire ends up. He ends up in jail or he ends up dead. Mm. And I, he I very just famously, to make, yeah. yeah I understand. Yeah. I, 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 but it doesn't familiar. mean that they don't. They can't last a long time. I mean, in Russia, it's not quite as cutthroat as in China. And is I think as long as these people look, they they have a facade. This the Russian Federation is not the Soviet Union, so they need to have these billionaires because they need to seem like a normal country. They need to see. They need to have a wealthy class that can interact with banks and things in the West, and they mm. need to be able to function within the international capitalist system. Yes. Because and, what usually the narrative is like this. If you look at people that are very pro-Russian, especially from the alt-right spectrum, they usually view Russia like Russia is a bit outside of this global capitalist market that it has. It's it, it, it's going against it and so on. And I want to debunk this and say this is absolutely not true. All of these financial institutions, they're heavily invested in the oil and the gas sector. So no doubt. And and, yeah. and they have and they have a very strong presence in 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 Moscow, I would say. Well, the, uh, the Russians, by the way, the the Russian, uh, the KGB and the Russian special services had a very important reason for picking Jewish people to be their oligarchs, because they needed to interface with the Jewish people in the international financial system. And well, they, not only that, but they had also they had very good ties with Israel prior to this. And there were like you and I who we discussed. I don't want to go into this controversy right, again. Right, but we had right. also many prominent Jews being in power in the Soviet Union. I don't want to go into the percentage right, and so on. Right. But you had but, many. But, uh, and yeah. I'll, I'll, I maybe I said this story on the show before. Uh, this was told to me by a Russian historian uh, who was close to the KGB and GRU at, at different times. 
And she told me the story. She knew about Mikhail Khodorkovsky, how he became the head of, what was it, Yukos Oil. Uh, he became one of these billionaires. Uh, well, they had these, they were reforming the Soviet Union. They were changing the economic system uh, from communism. And they were trying to privatize everything. And some uh, wealthy you know, people who were Jewish from the financial system in the West, maybe it was Goldman Sachs, she didn't say, they said, you know, it would be really wonderful if your head of your, your oil company here would, would be a nice young Jewish boy. You know, then it would, it would make, it would smooth things over. So then the, the, the committee that, that was involved in saying, hey, wait a minute, how do we sell this to the West? They said, can we get a young Jewish face to put on this? And they said, well, who would we get? And well, this young Kordokovsky, he's this Jewish kid who's the, the second secretary of this Komsomol committee here outside of Moscow. We could get him to be the, the head of it. And that's how he, Kordokovsky, got to be uh, a billionaire. Um, so, and that, sure. you know, but that you is have a also story a very, from yeah, inside, yeah. 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 You have also a very good exchange, Bukriz. You have very many, let's say, strong Russian-speaking Jewish communities in, in Israel and so on. So, yes, you have an exchange between uh, Tel Aviv and Moscow, no doubt. But, uh, yes, but I don't want to go too much into this. But I, another question that I, that I do want to ask you, if this, let's say, disintegration was somehow set in action or, or let's say, planned prior to this, if we look at the if we if we look at the geopolitical transformation, the Soviet Union lost substantial amount of territories. It lost Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. It lost the Central Asia. It lost the Caucasus. Uh, now, it, it, the way I see it with this is also if you look at that, there are some scholars, let's say very prominent realist scholars that they, that. They do not focus on, let's say, political ideology. They focus mainly on geopolitics and ter territorial competition between power, great powers. And they argue, some of these realists, that we, we had this latest, this not latest, but the, the NATO summit in Bucharest from 2008, when the, the NATO chose, chose a path of, let's say, direct confrontation with Russia by, let's say, uh, encircling Russia with nuclear missiles and getting in, let's say, having control, trying to flip over Georgia, trying to flip over Ukraine and other decentral, let's say, Central Asian countries and so on in order to encircle Russia. Now, what would you say to those scholars? Well, yeah, of course. Uh, um... What I would say is that, of course, the Russians understood that there was going to be a desperate game. And in many respects, the Russian plan has failed in certain res regards. They thought that the thing was going to go different than it did. And uh, the United States and the West played a much rougher game in getting what they wanted uh, than the Russians thought they were would be able to play. Uh, for example, uh, the Russians were playing to reunify Germany in a much slower fashion so that Germany would end up under the control of the left, would drop out of NATO and, and make a, a separate friendship agreement with Russia. And NATO would be gone. And the Warsaw Pact, of course, they voluntarily disbanded it. And that they would get Europe, the U.S. out of Europe that way. They would basically, that would be the angle. That never worked out for them. That went against them very badly. Part of the Russian strategy, the Moscow strategy here, was uh, a calculation. There were massive, we, we know there was a massive technological advancements were coming. We see what the computer age has done, the digital age has done. And the Russians needed to be part of it to keep up in weapons. And they were going to fall behind. Uh, and they realized what good are these, uh, these captive nations, including the Baltic states, uh, you know, Poland, uh, Czechia, Romania, you know, Hungary. What good are these in East Germany? What good are these countries? They have to police them all the time, you know, in terms of what was going on in the Baltic states. They have to end up killing people, you know, to hold on to them. Uh, they end up having to, 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 to quell uprisings. It's like 
this is becoming uh, a, an albatross around our neck. How can we trade with the West and get the capital and the technology from the West we need if we're a pariah country because we're suppressing but, all these people? Yeah. Better to let but, these useless countries go mm. from us because what are they worth? They're just mm. an albatross but, around their neck. Let's get them uh, up and then we can get the money and the technology and we'll be much stronger down the road. Of course, but if you look at it also, let's say the Soviet Union ge uh, geographically was, was was bigger than the Tsarist regime. I uh, I mean, in yes. terms of yeah. So so I mean, considering that amount of territories that they did actually lose, uh, for instance, uh, don't you don't you see it somehow? If you look at, for instance, you had a NATO intervention in Yugoslavia, in the Kosovo, in the southern parts of Yugoslavia region, where they have installed, let's say, army bases and so on. Uh, so they have curtailed somehow the Russian influence in the Balkans. And, and you see, like, for instance, they have, for instance, my native country, Croatia, is joining NATO together with Albania and so on. They are cooperating. So, so the, the, I mean, from let's say from a realist point of view, if you analyze, uh, let's say the power between, let's say Russia and NATO, it looks like Russia is very weak in regards to how they have lost territory and also how they are encircled by these nuclear missiles. What would you say about that? Well, Russia is not really encircled by nuclear missiles. The U.S. nuclear forces have basically, we haven't tested a nuclear weapon since the Cold War ended. Uh, our nuclear arsenals more than 10 years past its shelf life. We haven't created a new, we haven't built a new nuclear warhead in decades. Um, the U.S. missiles, we're, we're, our land-based missile force are Minuteman 3s. These were the missiles we were deploying in the 1960s. Okay, um, yeah. I, I see. But what do you say about deploying all those army bases in those territories they used to belong to the Warsaw Pact that might aim, aim towards Moscow? Well, or let's say what could be, Russia. Well, first of all, the Ru Russia has, when when Russia lost Eastern Europe, when Russia lost Central Europe, it left behind structures. The Russians didn't leave without the the commun. Each one of these countries are communist, and the communists controlled the wealth and the the uh, businesses and a lot of parts of these countries. And uh -huh. although they suffered in some of the countries some major setbacks and losses and lost control. In some of these countries, under different forms and guises, the, the structures, the former communist structures, remain in control of the countries. Um, there's been a struggle in Romania. There's been a struggle in Poland. They really lost a lot in Poland. But in places like Hungary and Czechia, um, uh, you can argue that they maintain very strong uh, uh, structures that are basically not visible to the rest of the world as structures aligned with Moscow, but they really are working with Moscow. And um, so it's a, uh, it's a, it's I, a I mixed do, I picture. Do. Yeah. Sure, I, absolutely. I just wanted to, I just wanted to, yeah. yeah, go a little bit contrarian to your position. But, sure. but if we look, but if we look here, Jeff, like for instance, they have, they, they have army bases, like for instance, in Kosovo. And so they obviously have, they, NATO was very successful in curtailing Russian influence in Yugoslavia and in the Balkan region. And naturally, you have also these power struggles. I'm not going against it. I fully agree with this. Now, but my question is, would you say, because let's say, for instance, a prominent neo-realist scholar, uh, I think he has one of the most influential scholars nowadays, it's John J. Mirza. I mean, he argues, let's say, when they had this summit, the NATO summit in Bucharest, that Western powers, they chose a path of, of confronting Russia that is provoking Russia to flip over, let's say, to take over uh, Georgia, to take over part of Ukraine, creating, I mean, provoking Russia, creating turmoil in order to just, uh, you know, make conditions much tougher for Russia. What would you say to an individual like that? Is this a fair assessment made or is it, you know, you don't agree with it, please? Uh, well, yes, of course. Uh, the people in Georgia, you know, um, uh, especially uh, Saakashvili, Saakashvili's uh, government, Saakashvili got rid of the MVD structures that were holding that country to Russia. 
And so he managed to get the country away from Moscow. And that was quite an achievement. And of course, you had these, these series of you know, uh, revolutions in, you know, orange revolutions in uh, Ukraine. So Russia had a real problem with, has, you know, it's really developed into a problem for Russia. Uh, they have various strategies for coping with it. Uh, but it's it's very interesting to watch because they have a uh, the the regime in Moscow has a kind of cancer uh, in Ukraine especially which could destroy their power. Um, they have prevented it. They've created a, a kind of a, a a break in eastern Ukraine to prevent it from contaminating Russia. But uh, there's a real threat that there could be a genuine change in Russia that the old structures could be overturned. So, so, you know, in a way, the Russians took a very, the, the communists in the Soviet Union made a very big gamble. And in a lot of respects, their plan has miscarried. But if you think about it, there's an analogy to a great uh, sporting event, the uh, Ali Foreman fight, where you get the term rope-a-dope, where Ali basically, his plan was to, to, to stand there and take Foreman's punches and just be, be beaten by him. Uh, with these punches, and then let Foreman get so exhausted punching on him that Foreman couldn't raise his arms anymore and then just come after him. It's, yes. it's called rope-a-dope, and, it um, and it worked. Ali won that fight. Foreman was a, is a formidable, maybe the most formidable fighter of all times, and he was beaten by this strategy. Uh, and you could say that this is kind of the strategy that the, that the uh, elite in Moscow has adopted. And yes. will it work? Oh, it's, it's a really good, kinda, it's a good, yeah. It's a good analogy. I, I want to say something in defense of Jeff Works too, because um, I, I, the way I see it is like this. Like obviously, like I said initially, you had some empires they're born, and naturally they are they fall. It's it's simply like that. History teaches us like this. But what is very interesting, in particular with the Soviet case, is that you have all those institutions, like for instance, especially if you look at the intelligence apparatus. Now, we notice something very particular, not maybe that much during, during Yeltsin's time, but when Putin came to power, when he was handpicked by Yeltsin in 99, in, in 2000, when he started the second war in Chechnya, and and we, we saw that somehow that it was we started rise again this FSB structure this KGB typical tactics silencing critics silencing let's say journalists and so on and and acting much more aggressive in world affairs so I would say yes naturally some of the elements they they are gone they are thrown into history's dustbin obviously. But you have also other elements that are quite still alive. And I would say that we also see this formation with the alliance with China. Here we see actual a geopolitical threat facing the West. Yeah, please, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned you're touching on the whole fact of the Second Chechen War. Yeah. And um, so it's, it's a, it, you know, a scholars, some of the best scholars who've looked at this are in agreement now that the Second Chechen War was a provocation, that the, uh, that this, that the KGB and interior, interior ministry structures uh, uh, in uh, the Russian Federation arranged for Shamil ba Basayev to uh, do the incursion, that both the French intelligence and Israeli intelligence monitored Basayev meeting with uh, the Voloshin, the chief of staff in the Kremlin, in the French Riviera, arranging the deal. I mean, they, you could say they got caught red-handed creating a, a provocation, which, by the way, included the Kobar Towers bombing. You know, yeah, I just want, I wanted to make this. This is very important for everyone here tuning in. The biggest anomaly... <clears throat> let's say with this russia victim narrative it's it is the apartment buildings that were blown up by and you know there's solid evidence suggesting that the fsb planted the explosives 
and and this led to the second this sparked off the second Chechen war it was a pretext for the Russians to go into and just simply destroy Grozny and install a puppet regime yes go ahead yeah there's there's a lot of scholarship and testimony about this now Um, yeah. the, the, um, the, thing, the thing that's going on uh, in the Second Chechen War is that, and you've got like the Mufti Kadyrov, who was made president of Chechnya by Putin uh, during the Second Chechen War, who all, yes. all the testimony is that the, 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 the power services, the power ministries in Russia, they wanted to bring back the regime, the uh, Soviet-type regime. And they needed this provocation. They needed this Chechen war to do it. And they needed a person like Putin. They were done with Yeltsin. They were done with, you know, pretending to be a democracy. And they wanted it to come to an end. They wanted it to come to an end. Exactly. It got out of hand with the, with the I mean, still, they have enormous problem with corruption, with oligarchy and so on. But they needed an authoritarian leader that was not simply a drunk individual, you know, making jokes about Japan having nuclear weaponry and so on, like Yeltsin did. He was totally crazy at the end of his, you know, reign. Yeah. So and, then, and yeah. they needed someone of KGB. And this is very interesting. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but they yeah. needed someone. And we have someone, an old school, let's say, KGB, um, let's say, activist and so on. All of a sudden, this man is, is in charge of Russia. So this should raise a red flag. Please, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, well, of course, uh, if you read about Putin's background, uh, if, you, if you read about Russia, if you read about uh, Putin, he, his main function was uh, to make, uh, to, to control businesses, not to get business. And, and his, his role as uh, deputy mayor of St. Petersburg was exactly this. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's important to realize that the actual function, the key thing here is control. The, the capitalism in Russia had to be always controlled and it had to be controlled by uh, KGB structures. That was but the not only, only way that, it was going to work. Yeah. And, and also I would like to say also the, the, uh, Russia was also well integrated into this world market economy and certainly invited and heavily invested by these investment bankers who, who invested in its oil and its gas supplies and so on in order to make Russia to, to just invite Russia into this economic system. This is also very important to bear in mind. But 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 the, the way I see it is like this, that naturally some of these it did not go the way they expected. It has morphed into something. I mean, probably it part of it did disintegrate, but it has now morphed into this Russian Federation. So they have rebranded their, their ideology and they're approaching China in a greater, you know, in a greater sense. And this this is probably the manifestation how we see it through this Russia Russian Chinese alliance. Please, Jeff. Yeah, it's. Um... It is hard to really read all of how it works now. It's not so easy to tell what exactly is uh, uh, going on at the top. But the one thing that we can say about it is when we look at their policies, they're working with China, they're working with Venezuela, Cuba, North Korea. When we look at all those things, we realize they're still on track with this long range strategy that Galitzin and other defectors warned us about back in the 1980s. But essentially, and also, yeah. So sorry, and also I would like to say not only that, but when they entered the Syrian war on behalf of harboring for this Bashar al-Assad, you know, and Russia, they have virtually no strategic interest in Syria. So, so what they wanted yeah, to was right. position. And what they wanted was to position themselves as the new power broker in the Middle East. So now we see often negotiation between Washington, Tel Aviv and Moscow. So Moscow is brought into this circle of great powers. So, so, so we see somehow a revival for, let's say, let's say Russian imperialism or, or Russian or let's say the so somehow of the Soviet foreign policy back again. Yes. 
Yeah, well, of course, uh, the, the idea always was uh, of the strategy to have the West feel there was no threat to, to distract them with the Islamist threat and mm -hmm. to cause them to not renew their nuclear defenses because it doesn't matter how many countries in Central or Eastern Europe Russia controls outright. It, the ultimate thing is the nuclear and advanced weapons because we know what happened to Japan in 1945. If you gain a supremacy in the modern weapons, in the, in the super weapons that are being developed even now, you will own the world and you will get more back uh, than you gave up. And that's kind of the gamble they're making together with China. China is the most sure. populous country. Some people think it's a much bigger economy even than the U.S. economy. Oh, for crying out loud, they manufacture everything. And they're making weapons in such volume and with such sophistication, it's really quite frightening. In fact, many people in the U.S. military are very frightened of the developments in China and that we have not kept pace with those developments. Well, I'll tell you. And we what, should what, be. And I yeah. think it's a good, it's, it is a genuine concern and we should, we should view it that way because that, that, like you said, Jeff, brilliantly, they control the global supply chain. They, they produce weaponry. They experiment with all sorts of, let's say, biological, chemical weaponry and so on, and nuclear weaponry. And also, they have an expansionist policy, with, you know, in the East Asian region and so on. So naturally, we should take this into consideration. Yeah. And, uh, yes. Yeah, and and we and it's really not talked about, but. This was done when, when Chris Cox ran the investigation into China Gate in the late 90s. When he was before a Senate panel, he was a congressman. When he's before the Senate panel being interviewed about his report, which anybody can read, uh, he, they asked him what the most surprising thing he found out about what China was doing. At the time, of course, the Clinton administration was giving secrets to China, like the secret of the W88 warhead. And... Uh, Lo and behold, uh, Chris Cox said, well, the most shocking thing we discovered was that how much Russia is helping China to militarily modernize. The Russians were giving them everything. We're helping them with missiles and nuclear weapons and conventional weapons. And they were working together very closely in all kinds of areas. This is in 1999. And of course, it has not changed uh, the kinds of cooperation, the intensity of the cooperation between Russia and China. Uh, has not been fully understood. And this military cooperation has implications not only for the United States, but for Europe. Because if the United States is defeated in the Pacific by a Chinese-Russian mm -hmm. combination, Europe might be defenseless to Russia after, in the wake of that. Mm. Yes, absolutely. I think it's a good point. I think it's a very good point. No, but I think, I think Jeff, I think we covered it quite well. I got your perspective quite good. Is there anything more that you would like to say as a finishing touch, or? Uh, well, yeah, the, the, the thing to keep in mind is when we talk economically is if you look at the countries that communists, the communists have taken over uh, since the Cold War ended, Venezuela, the, the, the big oil producer in the Western Hemisphere, uh, mm -hmm. aside from Canada, uh, and, of course, uh, Congo, uh, Angola, they won the Civil War in Angola, uh, they took over South Africa. Uh, they consolidated Namibia and Mozambique. Uh, you know, basically the mineral storehouse of Africa. Um, and you look at China's monopoly of uh, rare earth uh, metals, or rare earth elements, and Russia and South Africa's dominance of a lot of the strategic metals. You have to realize the kind of position that uh, Western aerospace is in right now if Russia and China suddenly decide, all right, we're going to cut you off from these metals. Uh -huh. We're going to, and so then what happens? How does, the, how does Europe and the United States cope with that? And of course, with the oil, they've been, they had just launched a oil industry with this, um, this attack on the price of oil. And of course, sure. with control of Venezuela, if they get control over Saudi Arabia, if they're able to convince the Saudis that the Americans are done, that the Chinese are the future, then who controls the global oil supply if the U.S. oil industry is in ruins and they control 
the major oil companies or have them boxed into a corner where they have to do it their way. You know, so this oh, is absolutely. what, yeah, we have to look oh, out for that now. Absolutely. No, I, I, I think I think if, if 100 percent correct. Russia, along with Saudi Arabia, somehow they did not want to, let's say, lessen the production. So that's why we have this problem with the oil price totally collapsing. This is so. So we need to follow this. And obviously, Russia, due to the fact that they're allied with China, they are still profiting from the low oil oil prices in regards to America because in America they have a different mode of let's say producing the oil that it's cost cost much more and now with the crisis that we're experiencing we will see many oil companies going bankrupt in the United States and this is primarily caused by by Russia and also I would say about Saudi Arabia what would you say yeah, you could see the end, of, you know, the United States was producing a tremendous amount of energy and suddenly, but that energy required oil prices to be at a certain level. I think it was uh, above $45 a barrel. And so yes, when you've yes. got oil coming down to what, negative 17, I don't know what it is today. Uh, to 20, what, 20, 21 something I last uh, checked Yeah, I mean, barrel. it's yes. negative price. The, the oil, tank, the people want, there's 36 oil tankers sitting idle off the coast of California here with nowhere to offload and the and the people are getting desperate and this is, this is a major hit on America's energy in sector and I think it's an uh, it's economic warfare I think it plainly is an attack and it's very cleverly done I think so too well Jeff I think we covered it quite well I want to thank everyone for tuning in here if you're new to this channel Hit that like button, please make sure to subscribe and also hit that notification bell so you're posted every time I post a new video. And as always, I'm keen to getting your take on the subject that we have discussed. Let me know what you think about the video. Did the Soviet Union disintegrate or not? Please leave us a comment and let me know what you think. Jeff, I want to thank you so much and let's do this again, okay? Okay, thank you, Rudolf. Right.